Namaskar and welcome to In Focus. Like the rest of us, Prime Ministers too have their defining characteristics. In the case of Indir Kumar Gujral, it's his style. It's unique and it's different. Today, for the first time, the Prime Minister talks about the very deliberate and conscious approach he brought to his office and the important consequences for the future. Prime Minister, in part one of this interview, I want to talk to you about your very deliberate and conscious style. Many people have commented on it admiringly, critically. How would you describe your approach to the office? I think I sort of summed up in my opening speech in the Lok Sabha. And I, I summed up and said that the office of Prime Minister deserves the restoration of dignity. Now, that dignity had been damaged in many ways. Charges of corruption was most whether they are right or wrong, that is not thinking. Issue basically is, that, that is, was one point. Dignity also meant trying to carry people with you. Not to be authoritarian, yet assert the authority wherever it is called for. Learn to carry people and give them leadership in the sense that they think they are one of you and they move with you. Basically because I wanted the prime ministerial office to be an office of sensitivity, human face, and dignity. Tell me something, was this determined by your personality or was this in a sense also a reflection of what you think the country needed? Both. What made you feel that this respectful, collegiate, soft-spoken approach would suit what many people call the rough and tumble of Indian politics? You see, rough and tumble of politics is there. I mean, to, to an extent it is unfortunate. But how do you bring back it to the touch of gentleness that Indian democracy demands and needs? So you were deliberately going back to an older era? I was. To older values? Older values. So in fact you were giving moral examples? Yes, number one, by my own conduct, by own, my own way of life. Every Prime Minister in India is looked up as a leader. And when a leader doesn't mean only this thing in the, in the, in the sense in which is commonly understood as a neta or something, no. By his own conduct, how does he behave, how does he live? What are his moral values? That matters. So for you, leadership was a question of morality rather than simply a question of asserting authority. Asserting authority is not called for. Practicing of authority is very important whenever it is needed to give leadership. Authority and leadership can be made synonymous. And that is what I was trying to do. Okay, let's look back at some of the incidents that took place in the 10 months that you were Prime Minister in the light of what you were trying to do. As you said, you were giving moral leadership. Now, many people say that one of the test cases that you faced was Lalu Yadav. With hindsight, do you think that now you should have asked him to resign more forcefully, more authoritatively? I have not done anything, and I say with great deal of uh, assertion, whether it is Mr. A or Mr. B, deliberately I am avoiding the names because Prime Minister should not name people whose cases are going on. Main point there was I did not do anything which a dignified, honest Prime Minister should not have done. I think I should close it there. But as you said, moral example is what you were setting. If you had just a bit more forcefully, just a bit more clearly told him to resign, he would have followed your moral leadership. Many people said you were too soft-spoken, too gentle. Well, that is my own way of doing things. I'm saying I cannot copy others. So they but misunderstood it. Ultimately, he had to step down, no? Would he not have stepped down earlier if you had spoken out louder? Why discuss a case which is still under subjudice? Many people again said when Sharad Yadav stood up and shouted at you in Parliament that your response to choose discretion as the better part of valor and ignore him left you looking weak. It suggested that you could be trampled upon. With hindsight, do you think you should have handled that differently? No, if, if I'm faced with a similar situation again, I will do exactly what I did at that time. I do not believe that a Prime Minister, per se, should shout back at people. No, that is not Prime Minister's dignity. And I mean, personal sense also. I don't want, as in Punjabi, you call it tutu, ma'am, that quit tit for tat and you use the street language if somebody else uses it. Also, in this particular incident you are talking of, Kindly keep in mind, it was a manifestation of a sharp difference of opinion, which still persists. And that is why immediately after the Lok Sabha election discussion, I went to Rajya Sabha and said, one of my jobs as Prime Minister is to try to persuade people, to convince people that the giving representation to women is in national interest. And that is what I will continue to. Tell me something, you said that dignity was so important. Was it in fact your sense of dignity that motivated you? to just take this in its stride and not respond? One. Secondly, 
whenever attitudinal change is called for, whenever social change is called for, it is not the shouting which helps, it is a persuasion which helps. And persuasion is the most important thing. Exactly. But you know, talking about persuasion, there are moments also when your frankness, your candor, has put you in a position of people saying, hmm, but it's unbecoming of a prime minister to speak so openly. Let me give you an example. In July, in this room, you said to me in an interview that you don't have a magic wand to cure corruption. Now, that's the truth. Everyone knows it. But your critics turned around and said, he's pleading helplessness. Instead of being active, he's finding excuses. You see, I mean, this is a difficulty in running an office like this. I personally feel that in a democracy, candor is very important, equally important. Because you are carrying the people with you. When you are carrying the people with you, they must know that you are not trying to pretend. You are not saying things which you don't mean. Sometimes criticism does come. In a vast democracy like ours, there is nothing that will never be criticized. But do you find that your candor often got you misunderstood? No. I think more sensible people never misunderstood my candor. But they turned around in the papers, they turned around on television and said he's the helpless prime minister. Well, that is the media's own new orientation. That is, sensationalism which is more fine. So and what you're saying also is that in keeping with your new approach to the office, some of these misunderstandings are just part of the stride. These are not misunderstandings. These are re-educations to understand how to live and run in democracy, where prime minister should not be something remote. Prime minister should not be something which doesn't talk to you as a family member, doesn't fam tell you as a senior person in the family, what can be done, what cannot be done. This is very interesting, the Prime Minister. Along. You are consciously re-educating us to think of the Prime Ministership in the office differently to the way we've got used to it. Well, I think there have been phases in India. I have been mostly uh, brought up in the Nehru's era. I think there was Nehru's way of doing things also. He was too loved, too tall a man for me to copy. But I think he set some examples for us. I tell you a very interesting thing. Once now I was talking to Nehru in my earlier years in government and parliament. And one of the formulations I always remember, he said, young man, politics is a derivative of politeness. Don't forget this. It has stuck to my mind. Politics also, Prime Minister, as you showed us, is a derivation of finding the right way of doing the right thing. Let me, let me with history in mind, and ask you to set the record straight. For many people, one of the defining moments in your prime ministership came over this issue of President's rule in UP. Many people said Mr. Gujral knew that his cabinet was going to force him into doing something his personal instinct wasn't in favor of. They say that you had a quiet word with the president to ensure that he sent it back to you so that your hands were strengthened. Can you confirm that? You see, I wouldn't confirm or deny it. Ultimately, you are running a cabinet system. There are two ways of doing it. Either you run a presidential form that you do not care what others say, or you run a cabinet system where you try to persuade and carry them, your colleagues with you, particularly in a coalition government. I have 14 parties. I spent 15 hours that day <coughs> in the cabinet meetings. Isn't it interesting that both decisions were unanimous? sending to the president and not second time sending to the president. I'm very interested about your answer at the beginning. You said, I won't confirm, I won't deny. Many people strongly believe that you had a word with the president and ensured that the first decision, which you personally perhaps didn't approve of, was sent right back for reconsideration so that your hands were strengthened. I knew the president's mind, not because I had conspired with him or I had But asked because him. you know the man. I know the man. Secondly, you So you also knew that when he got this decision, he would send it back. This was my hunch all the time. And I was telling my colleagues. And you were very happy when it was sent back to you because it was in keeping with your own thinking. Well, I wouldn't say happy or not happy. I would only say this thing, that that added to the responsibility on my part that I should not try to treat the president's advice lightly. And it gave you an opportunity to ensure that the right thing was done. Well, number one, but number more important than that, I set up an example that whenever a president sends back something, it should not be brushed aside lightly. And this is again part uh, of the new approach to exactly. office. Exactly. And that the president's advice should be treated with respect and the honor. That is the job of the... Uh, a prime minister must not always think and exert itself that he has more authority than the president. When a president occupies that office with a dignity as our president does, and I respect him for that, it is extremely important for me that whenever he thinks that his point of view is different than my own, 
I must give it due consideration that I gave. Prime Minister, you said you had a hunch he would send it back to you. Were you also hoping he'd send it back to you? Well, that is a different psychological thing. Main basic issue is that my, what was my purpose? My purpose was that my team must remain unanimous. And that is was my style entire these 10 months or so. There has not been a single occasion current when my, with the, any decision of the government of India in the cabinet table was not unanimous. The reason I bring up this example and the reason I'm probing you so persistently is because here's one example of extreme political shrewdness behind your handling. And if you were hoping that he sends it back, if you had a hunch he sends it back, then in a sense you were using the process to ensure what you wanted in the first place but couldn't get the first time around. You see, ultimately when you run an administration and when you run your government, you have to have some sort of a tactfulness in handling your colleagues also. And a strategy. And strategy may be not the correct word, but it is important to give the quality of leadership which does not, does not be become authoritarian, but knows how to carry people along, particularly your colleagues. Let me then try and sum up this part of the discussion by putting this to you. You've made clear your approach to the Prime Ministership. It's collegiate, it was gentle, it was to assert dignity, to give strength to the institution. So when people turn around, as some of your colleagues in government did and said, Gujarat hasn't got the killer instinct, Gujarat is not a leader of men, Gujarat is indecisive, are they misunderstanding what you're trying to do? You see, one thing is, depends upon what do you mean by leadership. Leadership basically in a democracy means capacity to persuade, capacity to convince, capacity to carry people, having patience to build consensus. That is my perception of leadership in a democratic system. Leadership but is not simply bullying people into falling no, into line. No, that is not democratic. That, that can, some people might do it, but that is anything but democratic. Okay, then let me put this to you. To what extent was your approach to the Prime Ministership hampered by the fact that the circumstances in which you became Prime Minister, 14 parties, often their differences were more apparent than their agreements, made you look weak? This was one government which knew how to work as a team. I gave that new dimension to it. I have been a minister in several other governments also, when single party governments were there. I think on the cabinet table, on every issue, on every issue, I repeat, the discussions have always been wholesome and thorough, and decisions have always been unanimous, This, despite their 14 parties. This is leadership. Let me put one last thing to you. Many people who are your friends and admirers say, Gujral is a good man, but he wasn't suited to be Prime Minister. What do you say to them? Well, I do not know if the people want a non-good man to work to them, or be a leader. India is essentially a nation of good people. With a, with a great tradition, a great tradition of culture. Therefore, I think this nation deserves a leader who should be good, who should be a gentleman, who should be honest. Let me tell you what their reply would be. They would say that goodness is no doubt necessary, but it's not sufficient. That leadership also requires toughness. It requires a certain capacity to bully. It requires a capacity to take calculated risks. You, this is, that is what I'm exactly saying. Was there any decision not taken, number one? Was there any policy not asserted? Assertion does not mean all the time shouting. You know, it is, I treat the whole cabinet as a family. How do I run my family? By, by, not by shouting or howling all the time. That is a style which I think India deserves and India will always get whenever it wants to prosper. If you had the 10 months again, would you do it exactly the same way? Exactly the same. And the same style? Same style and the same determination to carry everyone, not to shout, to lead. Same determination to lead, to take decisions, and to spell out your vision. There, Prime Minister, we have to end this part of the interview. I want to come back in part two after the commercial break and talk about some important lessons for the future. But first, we're going to take a break. Don't go away. We'll be back in just a couple of moments. Welcome back to our interview with Prime Minister Inder Komar Gujarat. Prime Minister, let's now turn to the future. You've been Prime Minister of a 14-party United Front coalition for 10 months. If after the elections we have another coalition government, whether UF-led, BJP-led or Congress-led, what advice would you give to the new Prime Minister in terms of how to handle the different parties? You see, Karan, coalition is not only an arrangement. Coalition is also a culture. 
and that is what I have been saying. My historic task has been to try to advance the cause of culture of coalition, how to behave with each other, how to conduct with those with whom you differ. But in and a sense, you're also them. saying that the new prime minister has to first acquire the culture himself. As a leader, naturally. So he has to change his mindset. He shouldn't keep thinking of himself as just a party man or a dominant party man. He has to think of himself as a sort of head of a college. Also, at the same time, not be an authoritarian, not to be an assertive, but to be persuasion. That's the persuade, most important lesson. Persuade isn't it? people. If you have a stronger point, persuade them, carry them, have patience. I think a leader in a coalition government has to have three qualities power and strength to persuade, having conviction enough to carry conviction with others, and patience enough to let people differ with you and get persuaded. How important is patience out of these three? Patience is extremely important. In one of the cabinet meetings, which became controversial later, I sat on the table for 15 hours till we were unanimous. In your own case as Prime Minister, to what extent was your patience tried by the fact that you had people with personal rivalries or clashing personalities and that they often took their problems straight to the press? They did. That is a test to my patience. But that is why I didn't let the things break. Coalition culture, Karan, is taking time to evolve and assert. Coalition as a political system is a reality. You cannot get away with it. But how to conduct your team is taking time. It always takes time everywhere. But you know, Prime Minister, conduct in a coalition culture is far away the most important thing. Let me again give you an example. Your communist colleagues had a habit of making their differences with the government clear to the press. They even at times staged dharnas against economic policy in public. And at times, they criticized you, they criticized your predecessor. Now, I know they have a right to do so in a democracy, and I know that they were only playing to their own constituency. But at the same time, they ended up giving the impression that the United Front is disunited, that it's quarreling, that it's unstable. That is where the culture will evolve. That time will take, whether within this parliament or one more election, Unless we come to this, some sort of an understanding, not said or written, but at the same time felt that when we are in a government, we have something to do with each other. Because let me tell you why I think this is important. A lot of people today talk about investor loss of confidence, of a recession and people not believing that the reforms are happening. The truth of the matter is you've had one of the best budgets ever. Reforms are happening. The fundamentals are very good. The loss of confidence is because the left keeps going around talking about complaints with the economy, complaints with the economic policy, and therefore politicians themselves, particularly your partners, create the problem. If somebody gets some advantage in public mind by differing with or speaking loudly outside, well, that is again a part of coalition life you have to put up with. So coalition culture means also learning to live with some of these contradictions. In every system there are contradictions. As I told you, in single party government, Aren't there pressure groups within the ruling party? Haven't we known that people sitting in the Congress itself when a single party government was there, seeing different things, forming their own groups? Okay, I understand. Let me put this to you, Prime Minister. Suppose we end up after the elections with our fourth hung parliament in succession. Would you then feel that the time has come for us to have our first all-party national government? In a multi-party system, space for opposition must always be there. It will be a sad day when opposition benches don't exist. And that space will cease to exist if a national government of the type I'm talking about comes into being. If every party in the House, in a nor normal circumstances, gets together and the opposition benches are vacant, that will not be good for good government. OK, let me move to something else. In the eyes of many people, if your style in office was perhaps the most important thing that you leave behind, pretty close to the second is your path-breaking attitude to relations with Pakistan. In fact, the subcontinent as a whole, but Pakistan in particular. What advice would you give the new prime minister in terms of how do we handle this difficult neighbor? I think what I have done is, which is that I have given a new orientation to Indian foreign policy, whatever it is called Gujarat doctrine, that we are trying to build a new relationship with our neighbors. For the first time, for the first time, I'm saying, including all the stalwarts, for the first time, all our neighbors look at it in a very differently than they used to look at us. I oriented a new policy in the name of non-reciprocity. Once we are able to do this, 
you find India's place in the neighborhood of SARC in a very different context now than it ever existed. With Pakistan problems, it's far more complex and far more difficult. Yet the beginning has been made. In six months or seven months, I have met Nawaz Sharif four times. I think uh, relationships also ultimately matter, how heads of the governments have relationship with each other. I take pride in saying that with every head of the government in my neighborhood, I have excellent personal equation, Nawaz Sharif included. Can I say one thing? Would, you, would I be correct in saying that at the bottom of your attitude to Pakistan is the belief they are just one of many issues for us. We may be the only issue for them, and therefore we must treat them with the proper perspective, not get obsessed by them. You have summed up correctly. And that, in a sense, would be the advice you would give the new Prime Minister. Don't that, get obsessed is, with Pakistan. That is why you have seen one of my policy directives of the Foreign Office has been, we don't react to their statements. We don't react to their speeches in the United Nations. We don't come to that polemics. And you're uh, asking the new Prime Minister to be as high-minded as well. well don't get I obsessed. Don't know how it, but I would think that the policy that I have set out for the foreign policy, if it is sustained, it will serve India well. Tell me one other thing. You started a process of talks with Pakistan which began almost spectacularly in summer. In the autumn, it ran into problems of nomenclature and procedure, and now at the moment it looks grounded. Is it dead or can it be revived after the elections? No, it is revived already. When we met in Dhaka, we decided to revive it. Main point has not been India. Main point has been internal contradictions within Pakistan itself. Democracy is in the infancy as yet. Power centers have not been determined as yet. So therefore, internal contradictions persist. I don't want to take more time to run them down on this because they are coming up. But I feel that it is being realized that ultimately we have to move in friendship. Tell me something, Prime Minister. You sketched out a vision of where this country with its neighbors should be going and where in particular India and Pakistan can go. But if we don't move down that road, do you see the danger of another war? Not immediately, but there no, on the I horizon. I don't see the danger of a war, but I see that the route is via SARC of cooperation. Bilaterally, we may or may not be able to achieve in a speedy way. But via multilateral forums like SARC, we can move here together. In which case, Mr. Gujaran, my last question to you. If we have another United Front coalition government or some other form of coalition government, would you be prepared to take a leaf out of Sir Alec Douglas Hume's book and serve again as foreign minister so that your unique talents as foreign minister can be at the benefit of the country? No, I think that is not the issue. It's a very hypothetical discussion whether who will form the government, who will offer me what. I am not standing in employment exchange looking for a job. Absolutely. But what's not hypothetical is that if someone were to come to you and say, Indra Gujral, please be foreign minister again, would you accept having been prime minister I today? Don't, I don't discuss hypothetical propositions. But you're I think not saying I have no. served this nation in one capacity. It is much better to leave a legacy than to look for a job. Prime Minister, on that note, everyone will interpret that answer as they want. But I am right in saying you haven't actually said no. No, I am not saying that. Nasha, no, it's not the issue. I am not looking for a job. Okay. On that note, thank you very much for speaking thank so openly to Info. Because that's it for this week. We'll be back next week with another interviewee. But for today, from the Prime Minister's residence at Three Racecourse Road, New Delhi, goodbye.